you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Today I'd like to talk to you about how to truly worship. We have worshipped, but I will say probably not everyone has worshipped. Okay? Because just attending church doesn't make you a worshiper. Okay? It is so important. Uh, that we take this time, this hour that we have, and truly focus on God and truly focus on worship. I was really struggling when I wrote this sermon uh, with a, another uh, title of a sermon, uh, How to Truly Worship is the one that I settled with. But my first thought was how to, walk, how to truly walk with God. And then the Lord told me when I was writing this and I was transcribing things Uh, that if you truly worship God, you will truly walk with God. So that's why I settled on this. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, let me give you four points. I know I regularly do three, but we are going to have four today. Number one, give your soul to God. And I'll say right off the bat, folks, you cannot truly worship if you have not given your soul to God. That is beginning of true worship worship. Number two, give your body to God. Your body is an instrument of righteousness, okay? And we have to give our bodies to God. Number three, give your mind to God. Your mind to God. Folks, there's where the battle is. I'll be talking about that in just a minute. You shouldn't be thinking about where you're going to eat right now. Ladies, you don't need to be doing your grocery list, okay? We don't need to be, you know, Youth, we don't need to be playing hangman or dot to dot or anything like that. All right? We need to focus on God. Give your mind to God. And number four, give your will to God. Folks, that's where the rubber hits the road right there. Because you see what some people think is if I just strongly will it, if I can will it, if I can do that, I can make it happen. Well, that is fine and good, but to truly worship, you have to give your will to God. You know, having concluded 11 chapters of profound teaching about salvation in the Christian walk, Paul now shares with us what we, what we need to give to God in worship. See, we're kind of a taking generation. We're this thing of what's in it for me, okay? And folks, I'm telling you, true worship is giving back to God. There's a big difference in attending church and truly worshiping God with all of our heart, our body, our souls, our minds, and our spirit. Our supreme calling is to serve God with all our being first and foremost in our worship. The key to spiritual victory and true joy in our lives is to surrender all we have to God and to be a living sacrifice, as the Scripture says, for Him. The Bible tells us in John 4.24, John 4.24, I want to just start out by reading that. John 4.24, God is a spirit. Notice capital S. It is the Holy Spirit that allows us to worship. That's why if you don't know Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And you can come to church, but you're not truly worshiping. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship. Notice the word must. It's a command. Must worship in spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, and truth, which is the Word of God. There's all kinds of opinions out there, folks. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to God, when it comes to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, all that matters is what the Word of God says, not what man says. So we must worship in truth and in spirit. My prayer for all of us today is that we will tune out everything on our minds for the next 30 minutes and totally focus on God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as we worship Him today. Romans 12 begins the practical living of a true believer in Jesus Christ. Give your soul to God. Look at verse 1. I I beseech you, therefore, Paul is saying, I encourage you, I admonish you, brethren, he's talking to Christians, 
the church, the Roman church, by the mercies of God. Folks, that's why I say the first thing we have to do is to give our souls to God. Because we have received God's mercy. Folks, we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve God's grace. But God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins, which Steve just sang about. And I'm telling you, the key to worship is giving your heart and your life and your soul to Jesus Christ. You can sing, you can read, you can go to church, but to truly worship, you must be a Christian. You must be a believer. And that's what he is talking about here by the mercies of God. Matter of fact, back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, just one verse I want you to see that here, that you shall love the Lord your God, love God, love God from your heart, with God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That was Moses speaking. Way back in the Old Testament, God's holy word, God's law said, this is what you need to do. And my question today is, are you doing that? As a Christian, as a worshiper, are you loving God with all your heart? Not part-time. I'm talking about in love with God, with all your soul. That is your being. That's every part of you and with all your strength. And folks, I am telling you, the key to worship is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. The key to salvation is the Holy Spirit. It is the thing that draws you to Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says in Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know Him. It doesn't say know about Him. I mean, most people know the story of Jesus. Most people acknowledge that there is a God out there. But there's a difference in knowing them intellectually and truly knowing the God of this universe. God wants you to know Him. You need to get to know God that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection. You think about that, folks. I mean, when Jesus spoke and Lazarus had been dead for four days, I am telling you, everyone there could not believe what they had saw. In that same power of the resurrection, and you think about that, we were dead in our trespasses and sin, and God quickened us. God made us alive in Jesus Christ. And since He did that for us, we should know Him. We need to get to know Him. And to get to know someone, you have to spend time with them. Not just on Sunday mornings, folks. Every day of your life, you need to acknowledge Jesus. You need to talk to Jesus. You need to uh, read the Word of God that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of of his sufferings. Fellowship. Man, we all like fellowships. We're having a fellowship tonight. I love finger food fellowships. <laughs> Why? Because you don't know what's coming. You don't know what. I like buffets. It, isn't it obvious? I like buffets. But that's not the fellowship that we're talking about. And do you realize that some Christians take their uh, worshiping as a buffet? They just go around to different places trying to figure out which one best fits them. But I am telling you, folks, what we have to do is we have to get to know God. We have to uh, commune with God. We have to ask God, ask God, where do you want me to worship? In the fellowship of His sufferings and being conformed to His death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection from 
the dead. Folks, when you give your heart and your life and your mind and your soul and your body to God, I am telling you, it is giving everything. What he is talking about is total surrender to God. I love that hymn, I Surrender All. I surrender all, all to Jesus. Folks, that's what salvation is. And that is the beginning of your walk in your life with Jesus Christ. I know it's simple. I know most people here are saved, but not all who are here know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And worship begins in our soul. Worship begins in our being, our total being. And we need to worship God with all of our heart, our mind, our souls, and our bodies. 2 Corinthians says it like this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There are believers and there are unbelievers. There are people that have given their heart and their life to Christ and there are those who haven't. That's what he's saying. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Folks, a lost man doesn't want to go to church. A lost man doesn't want to do what God wants them to do. They're being who they are. But when Christ comes into our life, everything changes. Everything changes. And it says, and what communion has light with darkness. It's either light or it's dark. We walk in this room and if I can't see anything, it's dark. And sin is a description of darkness. We were blinded by Satan. We did not know Christ. And that first step to worship is knowing Christ and inviting Jesus Christ into your life. And what agreement has the, has a, the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And I'll be speaking on that in just a minute. I will dwell with them, God says. I will walk with them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Folks, you want to hang around your people. My favorite day of the week is Sundays. Why? I get to hang around with you guys. I get to commune with God during the week, and I get to ask God, God, what do you want me to say to your people? Therefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate. And folks, we are mixing the world into church in too many areas, in too many ways. There is a separation there. There is a separation according to the Word of God. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. 1 John 2.15, I just thought of this. Love not the world or anything that's in the world. If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. Oh, folks, we have to forsake the world. Their ideologies, their, their thinking, what they say is sin and what we say is sin and what the Word of God says is sin. Folks, all that matters is what God says. So I want to admonish you right off the bat, right the first thing, give your soul to God, surrender to God, get to know God. The greatest day of my life was the day I surrendered all of me to Jesus Christ. I experienced the mercy of God, the grace of God. And I am telling you, and you think about it, folks, I'm living in heaven right now. I know this is not heaven. You don't have to convince me of that. But any time I worship, I get a taste of heaven. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? Can you imagine? I don't have time to go there. Number two, <laughs> not only give your soul to God, give your body to God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, this second part is so, so important. We're, we're talking to the Christians. We're talking to the saved folks. Present your bodies. Folks, our bodies, 
is, is who we are. You recognize me because of my body and, and certain correct characteristics that I have. All right? And the Bible says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. In the Old Testament, uh, you know, it was the Shekinah glory of God. It was the Holy of Holies. It was that priest that would go in once a year and, and have atonement for our sins. But now our bodies are God's dwelling place here on earth through the Holy Spirit. So we present our bodies every day. God, this is my body. God, this is your body. It's not mine. And a living sacrifice, a dead sacrifice does no one any good. Again, that's Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. The blood of the animals would roll back our sins. But the animals were dead. They were slain. We are alive. Think about it. What was the only living sacrifice that has ever been here on earth, literally? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But you know what happened? Up from the grave, He arose. He is alive. And He was and is a living sacrifice. He showed us how to do it. He showed us. And He was in body form, folks. He was in. He, he had a literally human body. He lived 33 years of perfection. Something that we don't even... 33 minutes is good for some of us. 33 days is even better. But 33 years that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Now here's the word. Holy. Man, when I think of God, I think of holy. Folks, we, we can't imagine. In our flesh and blood, we can imagine what heaven's going to be like. We cannot comprehend it. John, the apostle, just simply said, I hath not heard, ear, ear hath not heard, and I hath not seen. You have no clue what heaven's going to be like. But I tell you one thing. It'll be holy up there. No more sin. No more sorrow. No, no, no more death. No more crying. None of these things. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. Folks, God isn't unreasonable. He really isn't. He gave you eternal life. And we should, we should give back to Him everything that we are. Everything that we are. And one of the things that we can do in worship is giving our bodies to Him. Folks, not just on Sunday. Think about it. It's what you say during the week. It's where you go during the week. It's where your feet walk. It's what your eyes see. In that word, if you if you uh, you know write in your Bible, please circle the word holy. And I know I'm not holy all the time. I know I don't always say the right thing, but I'm telling you, I desire that in my life. And that's what he's saying. Give your body to God. Matter of fact, being spirit filled is the key to being holy. Being Spirit-filled. 1 Corinthians 6. Go to 1 Corinthians 6 with me. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee sexual immorality. Young people, save yourself for marriage. That's what the Bible says. Doesn't matter what the world says. Doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. He wants you pure. He wants you holy. He, the Bible tells us that marriage bed needs to be undefiled. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. You are giving away your body if you do that outside the marriage bounds. You are doing that. Your body is God's. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? 
Folks, I don't own myself. I do make decisions for myself. But God owns me. I signed up. I'm a soldier in the Lord's army. I go where he tells me to go. I do what he tells me to do. It's like the military. Man, you, those that have been in it, you know what it is. You don't wake up and say, oh, no, Sarge, I want to sleep in today. <laughs> you will find out a different language <laughs> by most sergeants. Not all. I'm simply saying we should wake up and say, God, I give, your my, I give you my body today. I give you my mind today. I give you my heart today. I give you everything. For you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Let me tell you the price. You say, was it a million dollars? No, it's worth more than that. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that paid for you. It was the Son of God's blood that paid for you. That's how much God loves you. Therefore, look at this. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are of God's. And folks, you cannot separate the body from the spirit because if you separate the spirit, you're dead. You're just dead. Now folks, we have to obey God. We have to give our soul to God. We have to give our bodies to God. And being spirit-filled is the key to that. Number three, not only give your soul to God, not only give your body to God, Give your mind to God. And I went a little quicker on the first two because of the third one. Folks, here is where we lose some battles. Satan has got us right where he wants us. He he does not want you to have confidence in your salvation. He does not want you to walk with God. He does not want you to read your Bible. He does not want you to pray. He did not want you to go to church today. I guarantee you, there's somebody here today that the devil did everything he could to try to keep you from coming today. But you overcame. You are here. My Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we have to give our minds to Christ. Look back in our text. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. We've already talked about that. But be ye transformed. Transformed. And again, I'm not really into kids' movies as far as that goes, but I've seen the Transformer movie or, or parts of those. And folks, what it means is totally changed by God. He transforms us. It's like... A, a butterfly, the transformation. If you've ever watched the butterfly uh, from a caterpillar and how that changes. Matter of fact, Lori has a little children's book that you take this book and you start flipping it. Have you seen those things where it's just a caterpillar and at the end and these pictures are going, Prr. Kylie loves that little book. Prr. Prr. Do that again for me, Papa. And folks, we have that same transformation in our lives. Before you got saved, before you were saved, you were lost. You were bound for hell according to the Word of God. But God changed you. Matter of fact, the Scripture tells us uh, in so many ways. uh, One is, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and we must be transformed. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that? By the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Jesus is already in the heart, folks. He's already there. He doesn't leave you. He'll never forsake you. So the battle's in the mind. You need to get dressed daily, spiritually dressed. Ephesians 6 We don't have time to go over there, but if you have not read that, read Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And it has the armor of God that you can get dressed daily. You can get dressed daily. We need to be transformed. And that transformation is the renewing of your mind. And the way you renew your mind is putting good things in. See, if you put trash in your mind, trash is coming out, folks. 
And so many times, uh, you know, we, we don't make good choices about what we are watching on TV or watching on our phones or maybe even the movies that we rent and some of the choices that we make that battles in the mind, and Satan wants to put those awful things in your mind. Satan wants to battle a God in that way, and our mind is where the battle is. And you can control your thoughts. You really can. And I understand there's a difference between thoughts and dreams, but if you will transform your mind, if you will keep doing it over and over again, eventually those bad dreams will go away, but you have to replace it with good things. Just like this, this year, I chose again. I don't know how many times I've done it, but I chose to walk through the Bible again. I, I'm reading through the Word of God again. And we have to put the Word of God in our hearts and minds. And it's so important that we do that. And, and, and it's very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, go with me. Very important scripture. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And I'm telling you, it's our minds. You ever been praying and lose your thought? You ever been praying and, and you're, you're really trying to pray, but man, it, something pops in your mind? Folks, I'm telling you, that's the battle. That's the battle that's going on. For we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty for God, uh, for God, for the pulling down of strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? It's any bad habit that you have in your life. Some people say, well, I can't quit smoking. Well, you just said it right. You can't. But God can. God can help you. Folks, you have to make it spiritual. You have, it's like me. I'm just telling you, on vacation, you'd think I hadn't ate for weeks the way we were doing. And towards the end, it was just like, I am sick of eating. Why? Because I've got an eating, not a disorder, problem. I don't even have to eat food. If I just walk by biscuits and gravy, they jump on me, okay? <laughs> and you laugh about it, but it is a stronghold in my life, and I've battled it ever since I was born. I rolled out at 10 pounds, not 9 ounces. <laughs> 10, 9. You ask, well, you can't ask my mom. My birth certificate says that. And I've been battling. Why we joke about it, folks, it is no different from smoking or having a drug addiction or having something else going on. And again, the whole deal is the consequences of these things. I mean, eventually, if I keep eating like I am, I'm going to die. I can just tell you what's going to happen. But the deal is, with God, all things are possible. I can quit. Look at verse 5. Casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You ever argue with yourself? No, nope, nope, you shouldn't do that. Hey, you know, I, I could be worse. And just start arguing. You ever argue with Satan? I wouldn't argue with Satan if I were you either. It didn't work out real well for Eve. Okay? I am telling you, don't even talk to him. You get in the Word of God. You start praying. You start memorizing Scripture. Now here's the goal. Here's the goal. I challenge, matter of fact, I double dog dare you to try this. You just try it for three days. Three days. And if you succeed, you come and you tell me you succeed. And God knows if you're lying. Okay? <laughs> three days you try this. Bringing every thought into the captivity of of the obedience of Christ. Every, whoo, why'd he throw that in? <laughs> I don't like that. No, most people don't. Every thought, because see, nobody knows what we're thinking. We can say something and think the exact opposite of what we say. But when you get serious, you know what I call it? In my, I, when I was a youth minister, I called it stinking thinking. 
It stinks. Sin stinks. If you can just think of it that way. My dad used to make catfish balls. And he'd get, you know, minnows, and he'd squish them up, and he'd get liver and get it all there. He'd do those things. And man, when you put those, oh man, it was the stinkingest thing. If we could understand, sin is the same way, folks. Sin stinks. We don't need it in our lives. And I challenge you, try it this week, bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Go with me. Colossians 3. Verse one, if then you were raised with Christ, that means if you're saved, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. We have to have heavenly thinking, folks. We have to think like Jesus. We have to have the mind of Christ to overcome our minds. And an idle mind is not good, folks. We need to keep them sharp. And here's verse 2. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, then you will appear with Him in glory. Verse 2, set your minds on things above. Folks, that is the only way you can get control of your thinking. Memorizing Scripture. Being filled with the Spirit. Spirit, total surrender. And then the last thing, how to truly worship. Give your will to God. Give your will to God. Look at that last. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and I love this word, perfect will of God. I want to ask you a serious question right now. Are you in the perfect will of God in your life? Folks, I've only been a member of three churches in my lifetime. Cameron Baptist Church for my first 36 years. First Baptist Church of Alma for 10 years. And I've been a member here for 18 and a half years and pastor here. And folks, what this is talking about Every time I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that God wanted me to move. That God had a plan for my life. Folks, we left both of our families in Lawton, Oklahoma, and one of the hardest things to do was to load that truck up and go to a place that I had never been, and I only knew one family in the whole church, and that was Pastor Bob Shelton. But I knew I was supposed to go there. I knew even when I was over there, and man, we were rocking and rolling over there, and it would have been much easier for me to stay there as the associate pastor than come here as your pastor. But God told me to go. And I want to say this, folks. There is nothing better to be than living in the perfect will of God. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. Are you living in God's perfect will? Folks, it's not about us. It's not about our vocation. When I was a kid, I just wanted to play baseball for the Cincinnati Reds. And that's just another story. I had met Johnny Bench and, uh, you know, my uncle, uh, you know, as far as he, he was, he had the same contract as Johnny Bench did, the very same one. They both played American Legion ball in Binger, Oklahoma together. But two weeks before they both were supposed to go up, he was on his last day of a job, and he would, he would uh, drive in his uh, company van back to the house, or back to the warehouse to turn it in. And two ladies passed a hay truck and hit him head on and killed him. And I'm telling you, it devastated me. I was 10 years old. And from that point on, all I wanted to do, not necessarily to take his place, but to be a professional baseball player like my Uncle Danny was going to be. But God had other plans in my life. I was starting uh, center field. I was on full scholarship 
They paid, paid for everything at Cameron uh, College there in Lawton, Oklahoma. I was the center fielder. And in 10, uh, uh, in 10 games, I hit a ball off the center field fence. And as I rounded second, the base come out from under me and snapped my ankle. Just snapped it. I was told even by Coach Seymour at Oklahoma that if I, at, at OU, that if I would go to Durant, play one as my freshman, go to Durant and play, I could play for the Oklahoma Sooners, which, again, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. But you know what? I do not think. I would have ever been in this place here this day if I didn't. And folks, I'm telling you, it wasn't that it was, I mean, it was God's will, but if he'd have just asked me, hey, why don't you quit baseball? Why don't you just get in the ministry? I, just, <laughs> I don't think so. But even God, knowing, God knowing. And folks, I am 64 years old, and I am doing in my life what God has has destined me to do. There's nothing else I want to do. There's no other place I want to go. Because this is home. This is what God wants me to do. And I'm telling you folks, the perfect will of God is the best. And, and sometimes we look at things that are good, and we look at things that are better, but do you know what God wants for you? He wants His best. His best. And sometimes He has to take things away from you to get you in His perfect will. And while we don't understand all that God is doing, there's no better place to be than to be in the perfect will of God. Prayer is the key to finding God's will for your life. Prayer is the key. I hope you write that down. Matthew 26, and I close with this. Matthew 26. And this is Jesus Himself, folks. This is how Jesus did it. Then Jesus came with them, verse 36, to a place called Gethsemane. The word literally means pressed. He was about to die. He's about to go to the cross. And the disciples, sit here while I go and what? Pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Why? Because the human side of him, if you punched him in the face, it hurt. If you pulled his beard out, it hurt. When those nails went through his hand, it hurt. And the human side was thinking, then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face. What? And prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was going to happen. He knew the pain and the sorrow. He knew it. But yet, no, look what he said. I love that next word. Nevertheless, not as I will but as you will. Folks, you better thank your holy God that Jesus did the will of His heavenly Father. He was in perfect harmony with His Father. I just want to say, the key to spiritual victory and true joy is not getting all we can from God, but giving all we are and all we have to God. I'll say it again, the key to spiritual victory and true joy is not getting all we can from God, but giving all we are and all we have to Him. Father, thank You for the day. And God, I pray that, and I know most people have given their soul to God, but Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know You, I pray they would do it today that they would come down the aisle and give their heart and their life to Jesus. God, I pray we'd give our bodies to God. Oh, we always don't do that. We don't always do that. I pray we'd give our minds to God. That's the struggle. And I pray we'd give our wills to God. God, I pray that we would truly worship. And as we go from this place, after we have worshiped, God, I pray that we would truly walk with you this week. I pray that when we walk in a room, somebody would know that it's different. I pray that the Holy Spirit would so well up in us that they would say there's something different about that person. And God, I pray that we would just do our best to stay in the perfect will of God. God, this is your day. 
This is your church. This is your invitation. And God, I pray that our folks would just be uh, honest with themselves. And God, I pray they would simply obey the Holy Spirit. Whatever God tells them to do, I pray that they would do it. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the challenge from the Word of God. God, we give you this time. We love you. And God, I pray especially for the Christian. God, I pray that they would use that word. Lord, there's one word that has to happen for all this to happen. It's discipline. We have to discipline ourselves to pray, discipline ourselves to read the Bible, discipline ourselves to memorize Scripture. So God, I pray that we would do it with all of our heart, our soul, our minds, and our bodies. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?